Uh, thank you for coming to our session on social media. We've got a fantastic panel. Uh, included on our panel is an extremely important man because he is one of our sponsors. And before we start, um, Amit would like to thank uh, our workshop sponsor, Talk Walker and Christoph, for your support. So thank you very much, Christoph. Um, so I'll introduce the, uh, introduce the panel to everybody. Um, immediately to my left here, we have Sam Flenning, who's already done a session this morning, uh, which I think is going far above and beyond the call of duty, because he only flew in from Shanghai uh, this morning, came straight here, done one, one panel session. We've got him on a workshop now. Uh, so thank you very much, Sam, for coming. Um, Sam was the founder of a company called CIC in Shanghai, in China, uh, now, I believe, called Kantar Media CIC. So after 10 years, uh, successfully sold it to Kantar, where he's the CEO and he's at the forefront of social in the Chinese uh, region, had, had deep experience of that explosive market for 15 years. Uh, sitting next to Sam, we've got Adam Parker. Adam is the founder of Listed, which is an online discovery engine that identifies the people and the content that matters. Uh, Adam is a fellow member of the CIPR social media panel with me. Um, and I first came across Adam a number of years ago when I was running Metrica. And someone wrote a blog post about us from a blog called Show Me the Numbers, uh, which instantly terrified me, and it was Adam. So Adam's had a, 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 a deep um, interest in, in measurement and, and numbers. But now he's moved that into the area of influence, which is fascinating. So we have our, our sponsor, uh, Christoph Folchett, sitting next to Adam. Uh, he's the founder of Talk Walker, which is a social analytics company. Uh, and he's in charge of the strategic direction uh, of that business. Uh, so thank you, Christoph, for being here. And thank you again for the sponsorship. And finally, at the far end, we've got Ben Levine, the research director at Ketchum, uh, where Ben develops and leads research across brand, corporate, and the healthcare practice uh, for that international agency. So everybody represents different areas. Uh, obviously, Sam, social, deep understanding of social and the Chinese market. Christoph, platforms. Uh, Adam, influence. Ben's got a large uh, agency experience. And for those of you who, who don't know me, my name's Richard Bagnall. I'm the chair of Amec's social media measurement uh, committee. I'm, I'm also a board director of Amec. Uh, with Paul, who's sitting at the front here. We ran Metrica for 18 years before selling it to Gorkana, where I worked for four years. Uh, and more recently this year, I've joined Prime Research uh, in the UK as its UK CEO. So that is now me uh, there. So in terms of the session today, um, we're going to split into sort of d d doing two parts, if you like. First of all, we're going to look at some of the findings from the international uh, business Insights Survey, and particularly from social media. And what I'd like us to do is, I'd like all of you to consider yourselves at this point as part of the panel. Because I'd like us to think about what does this actually mean, and what does this mean for our business as we go forward. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull out a few things, but let's, let's stop and think about that and ask ourselves some, some questions. The second part is going to be um, five minutes from each of our panellists, where they're going to tell us what they think uh, next year, and I suspect a couple of years after that as well, what are the trends that we're going to be seeing uh, in social media? What do we need to be doing? How do we need to respond? What do we need to be aware of? Uh, and I'll be doing my own five minutes on that, but I, uh, as the, the panel lead, I have a special dispensation to be a little bit longer because uh, I've got um, some other stuff I want to just make sure that everybody in this room is aware about, which is the launch of the social media measurement uh, framework user guide, which we've launched today. And I'd really recommend that everybody starts using it. And I'd be very grateful if we'd all start promoting it as well. So I'll take a little bit of time uh, to look at that too. OK, so first of all then, um, looking at the results from the survey. Um, what we can see here is the percent of members' clients that are including social media. Now, I think there are some pretty interesting numbers that come here. The headline figure is 42% of our members' clients uh, are including social media. But when we break that down and look at it in a bit more detail, there's some, there's some uh, very interesting things. First of all, when we split it out by AMEC members who are PR agencies, that number's much higher. It's 72%. You might expect that, but of course, what does that mean? Um, it means that 33% of the traditional 
so, uh, media measurement companies only are measuring social media. So that seems to me a very low number. And I wonder what, what, how that might, you know, what, what, what everyone else uh, may think about that. And then when we look at it by region as well, we can see that, again, the two areas that dominate this are North America with 60% and transnational, meaning big agencies that work across the globe, uh, at 60%. And, of course, that then means that the different regions are much lower. And we can see Western Europe just 34%. Uh, and falling away down to Latin America and, and Africa at 21%. So why so low in the regions as well? Um, one of the thoughts I had on this was that maybe uh, a lot of the campaigns are being uh, procured centrally by, 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 by the headquarters, perhaps there in America. So a question, um, Sam, maybe as you're um, from, the, from the China region, what, what insights do you have on... Um, on why that number is low, what sort of reasons are there uh, in your mind that that, that number is not higher in that region? And are you are you seeing? Are you, uh, is this, can we have the microphone on for the panel? Hello. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's on. Yeah. yeah. And are, are you seeing that uh, things are being procured perhaps in America at headquarters, and therefore not so much opportunity to to win that account regionally? Yeah, I, I see that w when you think of Asia Pacific, or so when we look at Asia Pacific, um, we see that there's China and then there's outside of China. Now, maybe that's because I'm sitting in, chi in China, but China is its own, it's such a massive market, and there's so much investment in China and so much focus on China. So, I mean, I, I think for PR, if we did this just for China, it would, I, I don't know any PR agency or anyone that's doing anything in media that's not also doing social for China. Now, outside of China, uh, we do see that uh, when we go to some of the, like Hong Kong or Singapore, big cities, but relatively small markets, uh, we see that there's not as much uh, focus on social. Uh, sometimes it's the clients that will be just doing a little bit themselves. They don't. It's not big enough or substantial enough that they're they're going outside to outside agencies. Yeah. And then because uh, they have such small budgets for it, um, and so then s some of those will be picked up by the trans. We call it the transnational something that's picked up. You know, a global deal that's won in, in Europe or the U.S. Uh, but then the local clients usually won't be using whatever tool that they're offering. Yeah. Because it won't, usually won't work in, those, in, in Asia Pacific yes. very well. Yeah. And Ben, what about you representing a, a transnational uh, PR agency? How, how do the numbers uh, there, and obviously the PR group number as well being so high, how does that, how does that fit with, with you? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think from an agency perspective, first kind of commenting on the split between PR groups and I, uh, AMIC members that are focused specifically on media measurement. I think the discrepancy for me and what I'm seeing from an agency perspective is that as an agency, we often position ourselves as tool agnostic and are there to find the right solution for our clients that best fits their needs uh, and also purchasing tools for ourselves. So we'll invest in tools such as a brand watch or reading six or what have you. Um, but then also sometimes clients have tools in-house that they use and they tap into us or ask us to kind of uh, use that tool on their behalf. So th I think maybe that could be part of part of the split there. Yeah. Um, and I think definitely from a central perspective, a lot of the social media measurement work we do will be done from a central hub. So often, especially in London, a lot of the accounts we work on being global, we act as the central hub for an account, creating strategy and approach for other markets and deploying that and then setting up measurement from a central perspective that's probably captured, would be captured in that transnational uh, yeah. uh, figure okay. there. Yep, thanks Ben. And so the audience, the panel, these are our numbers here guys. Anyone here with a view? We've got uh, Tim Marcane, who we welcome back to the Amex Summit after a, a gap Thank year. You. Thank you Richard. Yeah, I, uh, from the, um, I guess from a US perspective or maybe a global perspective or with global headquarters clients in the US that I mean, I find that they're, well, 100% of clients are doing social media. Uh, some of them are doing it with agencies other than their PR agencies, so that could describe the gap between 100% and the 72% there. Uh, but I think for the most part, if they're doing social media measurement, they're doing it either in-house or with a specialist social media intelligence or social media analytics agency, uh, 
or group as opposed to necessarily a traditional AMEC member. Yeah. Uh, and so in some cases, you know, there's a distinction between traditional media measurements happening over here and social media measurements happening in another place. Yeah. And the same from uh, impact in India with a view. The profile of clients that we work with, who are typically public relations professionals, they have not started to start to own up the social media domain within their corporate organization. As a result, the marketing or brand uh, counterparts have started to own the space, and therefore that work is not coming to us, but going to the digital teams within the advertising agencies. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else with a view? Bef yes, Carlos. So I'm afraid uh, in, in the annex, but the first question, I think, of the conference from the annex. So thank you, uh, Carlos, at the, at the back over there. <laughs> It's not a question, so it's not the first question from the annex. However, I think that in many cases, um, my experience being in Latin America, I'm Carlos from Global News, in many cases what you see is that smaller companies, they would rather spend a little money on a very cheap employee to handle their social media needs, which usually is a person who knows nothing about social media and who will not do their job adequately but will be very inexpensive for the company rather than to hire a service from a traditional AMEC member. At the same time, as Asim said, companies do tend to have the social media part in marketing because marketing arrived much faster to it than PR in all regions. And so PR was kind of relegated social media wise and you can see that the marketing people, they're actually even when you see at university, in marketing, they have social media. In PR, they don't in many of our universities. And yeah. especially in the PR-focused ones, you see that they're, they're still not doing social media or it's not mandatory. Yeah. And so that, that's one of the main reasons I would care to venture, I guess, and say why in Latin America and, well, I don't know the African market, but why in Latin America you, you see that, whereby you, there are members who don't offer social media. Yeah. Or clients and who and when you've got people in-house do, I guess doing the implementation and the measurement, if they're not experts, they're probably just counting the stuff that's easy to count rather than doing the measurement. That's an educational yeah. challenge. And, and not only are they counting the stats, they count them the way that they look good, and that doesn't benefit the company at all. Of course. Okay, so we'll, we'll move on to, uh, to the next slide. And this is the proportion of clients uh, that are reporting that... Uh, or what we're reporting that are including social media measurement. The first thing that strikes me on this uh, slide is actually how late AMEC member companies were to social media measurement. 2011 is when we first started even counting it, and back then, as you can see, it's only uh, 11%. But the positives is that we saw explosive growth. You could say it doubled um, from 11 to 12 and doubled again to 13. But this strikes me as a question. We seem to have hit a plateau. We've gone from 39% to uh, 42%. Uh, that's not the explosive growth that I would have expected. And it, it leads me um, to ask some questions about what might be going on there. Um, do we think that perhaps the market's getting saturated? Is the, it, it, uh, is the, the, the reports that we're having that social media is something that people want, is it just that it's the big organizations doing more social media. Many of our uh, member companies aren't doing social media measurement. So that I'd like to throw that out to the floor first and see if there's... Is, are there any AMEC member companies here that aren't doing social media measurement? So I see everybody here claims that they, they are doing some form of social media measurement. So has anyone got any views on why, why we're not seeing... Um, seeing this growth. So, Asim, just, just wait for the, the microphone, please, Asim. While we're doing social media measurement, we are not doing it in a scalable way. As in, I can say that for, for our firm. We have few clients wherein we are able to deliver very good quality work on social media measurement, but we are not able to scale it the way we, we are able to scale traditional measurement services. And probably one of the issues is that uh, we are not able to convince all our clients that the methodology that we have is a standard methodology that can be followed. Yeah. 
and, and that they're buying it elsewhere, I think, as well. And are we satisfying their need? And I think it's a question that I would you know, recommend that you all ask yourselves, is there seems to be this, this disconnect here. Um, and are we saying the right things and doing the right things and talking to the right people? Because 47% of you say that you think this is a big growth area. And that is not a big growth area, to my mind, in the way that it's being, being reported there. So the next, the next slide um, is looking at the, the media channels. I think what's interesting here is that for digital media, so online media, most of us do it. 86% of us say that we analyze online media. So that's the, the, you know, the, the, the newspapers online. But when you look at social media, it's the third one down there, that number's, uh, that number's dropped away to 42%. So why are we measuring online news, but we're not measuring online conversations? That's what, what it seems to suggest to, uh, seems to, suggest to me. Um, and even more scarily, were, were, were these numbers right down at the bottom? So down uh, at the very bottom, uh, we've got paid media, such as advertising, with only, uh, that says 2%. Um, and own media is the second bottom with 14%. Now, we're all talking about measuring across paid, owned, and earned. We're talking about silos coming down. Um, I mean, ben, uh, ben and I were talking over a coffee earlier today, and Ben was explaining some of the challenges that, that, that Ketchum has. Perhaps you, could you elaborate a little bit on uh, the competition now and how, how the agency sees itself sure. across these sectors? Sure. So uh, I think at Ketchum, we're increasingly find, particularly in the London, UK market, that other agencies, be it digital advertising, are uh, continually cr encroaching on the public relations space. And I know this is felt in some other European markets as well. So I know one of the things that our, our European CEO, Dave Gallagher, has actually said is that he believes that the agency of the future, PR otherwise, that we're all going to look the same, that we're all going to have to have the right skills in-house to deliver what the client wants. Because we don't think the client cares where their advertising comes from, where PR necessarily comes from. They care about are getting having the right solution to fit their business needs. Um, so we are been making a big push to try to include, you know, adopting a PESA model and ensuring that as much as we can, having a paid, earned, shared, and owned strategy. And we're starting to do work like that with clients uh, such as Philips and even starting to get into the using paid space to help uh, kind of drive uh, campaign yeah. uh, results. And I, I think this is a wake-up call to our industry, that the PR industry is changing and we need to change with it. We can't keep paying lip service. We can't have that... Uh, measuring paid media 1% next year. All will become irrelevant. Um, so, uh, Adam, uh, you and I were also talking, and you had a perspective um, with the case study that you saw with um, Volvo and um, Van Damme, and you asked me a question then, so uh, about you know, were how would people measure that? So, would you like to make that point? I don't know if anybody else was in that, 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 that session. Actually, I'm one of the people who hadn't ever seen that video, even though 72 million other people apparently have. <laughs> the, uh, and so in terms of the sort of specifics around that, one thing I wondered about was what we would define a client's YouTube channel as. Would people see that as social media? So you'd see that as social media measurement and maybe therefore some form of shared sort of content. Or are we talking about own media because it's their <laughs> channel, even though it's not on their own properties? Um, see, I would see that as its own. It might not be it's not, it's not on their website, but it's 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 their message in their words. Um, but would everybody classify it as that? Actually, the gentleman from Lenovo, who's yeah. oh yes, there we are. I wonder what well, how you would classify owned. owned. Yeah. yeah. Would everybody agree that that's what it should be classified as? Yeah. Because you don't have to earn your spot on that channel. Yeah. So then, how would we have measured that campaign? Uh, uh, th given that the implies. impact it had, that's right. if we weren't addressing owned. We wouldn't have even touched on any of that, and we saw this morning how significant it was. Um, can you t t give Jason the microphone? Then introduce um, yourself, Jason. Yeah, Jason Weeks from Gorkana. I mean, if we agree that it's an owned channel, then how do you classify the comments uh, on there? Are they then therefore earned? Yeah. Irrelevant, mostly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good question. It's all, um, all, all the kind of stuff that we need to get a 
uh, a consistent view upon, because we have to be consistent with this kind of stuff as well. Otherwise, we're going to look um, even more silly than we often do, and frankly, even more irrelevant than you could argue that we're, we're at risk of making ourselves. So again, a, a wake-up call um, here. We can't say to ourselves, I've heard it so many times at this conference, we're going to move into marketing sphere. I've heard lots of companies that I've, I've consulted with saying we're going to move into the marketing sphere, not with this kind of uh, result, we're not. Uh, there are big, serious competitors in that space who we, will just blow us out of the water. No chance, unless we get more serious about this. Richard, could I just make one quick yeah. point? Um, in a sort of similar vein, um, what about journalists or media out outlets promoting their content on Twitter and social? But actually, that's media monitoring, because that you know, uh, certainly in the UK, journalists on Twitter are a huge voice, massive significance. So I would see that as highly linked to media monitoring, even yeah. though it's on a social platform. These things aren't channels that can be broken down. They, they all mix together. So one of the things that AMEC does is it, it supports um, a, a bigger group um, called the Coalition, and that's part of something called the Conclave, which you may have heard of, um, which is about setting social media standards uh, and about setting them not just in a PR silo but across other marketing disciplines. And we've got uh, Tim and I think we've got Jonna in the room who both sit on that um, conclave, and I, um, I wonder whether you guys have a perspective on, is the conclave doing work? I know it was talking about it in terms of saying, we'll call this type of content one thing, we'll call another type of content another thing. Uh, do you have any insights to share with us on, on that? Yeah, well, I think it's consistent with what was just discussed, that, uh, you know, I think social spans peso, uh, as do some of the other channels, so you have to look at, well, what content was published uh, in that channel. So uh, one of the things that's confusing is uh, are we using paid and shared and owned in reference to the channel or in reference to the content uh, within those channels? But I, I think in the, the uh, SM, SMM standards uh, that have been published, I think there are some distinctions that are made to be able to clarify that. Uh, and I think it's consistent with what you just discussed where, yeah. you know, if you're publishing to and owned, if you own the channel uh, where you're publishing or own the um, site, uh, where you're publishing, that would be owned. But if there are comments on that site, then the comments are earned yeah. uh, and being able to break it down that way. So an early takeaway from today's session is make sure everyone goes to the Social Media Measurement Standards website at smmstandards.org, um, where the draft standards, I don't think they've been ratified fully, had they, but the draft standards are there. So make sure as you think about how you're doing your measurement that it's consistent uh, with, with what's on there. So we can all start to look like a proper grown-up industry that's talking the same um, language. And you can follow the conversation on Twitter with the hashtag SMM standards um, as well. Richard, maybe one other thing to yeah, add to your Tim. point and the challenge to this room. I mean, I would contend, I mean, nobody measures this specifically, but I would contend that the social analytics business or the social analytics market is bigger than the traditional analytics business. Right now, and so, like what Sam's team is doing in China is indicative of where things uh, are going. Uh, and I think there's bigger market opportunity for most of the companies in this room to not only partially embrace social, but fully embrace social and, and become leaders uh, in it because the, the market appetite for it is just huge. Huge. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so just picking up some pace then. Here's our potential growth activities that, that, that we believe. So, um, specific to, to digital is, is in the fourth place, digital and social media measurement analysis. So as I said it already, 47% of us think this is a big growth area, but we've already seen that certainly last year it was plateauing. So we need to do, uh, we need to do something um, about that. Um, and that number incidentally there is slightly down on last year. So we're a bit more pessimistic as an association for the opportunity of social media measurement. Um, and there you can see 53% of us think that we're going to go marching into the marketing analytics business in the next year. In second place. Um, and the final slide I wanted to pull out from, from the um, Business Insights, so which incidentally I, I, I was mentioned in the session earlier today, but you should all already have received it. Uh, it was sent out earlier this week, was the changing client demand. So we're seeing uh, this is a net increase 
So it's the percent who say it's increased minus the percent that say it's decreased, uh, somewhat like a net promoter score effectively in the way that it's worked out. But 81% are saying uh, that, that client demand is increasing for social media. But look, look down here as well. Look at, again, we've got paid media, own media. They're pretty low. I'm sorry that the um, values haven't, haven't come through. That's a, a PowerPoint version uh, issue. But those numbers are 11, 7, 4. And this radio one, which for some reason has shown, is it's a negative, minus 6. Um, you know, radio, if you talk to the advertising uh, community, they say it's, it's booming. It's booming. More listeners, they all want to get on radio, but for some reason we're saying we're not going to measure it. We don't, we're not seeing that as a demand. And what about, what about you know, the broadcast as well? Pictures, people are lazy. I think as content explodes, there's more content. People, you can't read everything you get sent. You much rather listen to it. Think of the, the, perhaps the blogs, um, the... Uh, the um, a podcast, rather, that you might listen to when you're out on your run because you don't have time to read that content, but like things like for immediate release you might be re uh, listening to. Uh, people tend to, uh, tend to listen to that now rather than read it. So shouldn't we be measuring that kind of stuff? Again, it just seems to me to be very low. So, yes, please, question. Qu quick point on that. Yeah. Though. Interesting, interesting set of stats, even though the numbers aren't there, but interesting yeah. that... Surely what social is doing is actually increasing the value of television because it's reframing TV, if you like, because if you look at so many programs now that have integrated social into the programs, if you watch, okay, I watch trashy American TV, but if you watch something like Suits, you can follow Suits. You're, you know, the, the hashtags, you know, yep. you know, Lewis Litt and what would Harvey do? Sorry, I'm obsessing. But... Programs like that, it's, it's changed the whole way you follow it. Idol, American Idol, you can really tell my, my TV viewing. Yeah. But American Idol as well. So, so to not measure it, from a brand point of view, to not measure it, then you're not measuring the impact that actually social is having across all those other channels as well. So yeah. that seems to me to be a little short-sighted. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and if we don't measure across those other channels, we face the same challenge that Ben's talking about of becoming irrelevant because the brands want it. And, and, and I'm totally the same. I haven't heard of any of those TV programs that you just mentioned, but I... <laughs> <laughs> <You're staying boring. laughs> I do. <laughs> I have a wife that makes me watch property programs. It's awfully boring. <laughs> it's all about grey paint, apparently, this year. Um, <laughs> but I am a... Um, I am a two-screener, so I'm exactly the same. I love to watch a program and look at it. It's, it's, and hand, hands up, let's have a show of hands. Who frequently finds themselves watching TV and looking at a Twitter stream at the same time. You know the name for that is meerkatting, don't you? Meerkatting? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm an optimistic measurement person, so I'm giving that 40% of us. It's actually, it gets very addictive when you do it, so, um, so I highly recommend it. Now, before we move on, because that's it from the, uh, from the survey, so we'll move into our into our views on what's coming in the future. Any further thoughts on what we've seen and, and I mean, what about views on what we need to do? I mean, what, 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 what does the audience, the panel, think uh, we need to be doing? What, what have you t anyone got a view of what they might have taken out from there? Richard, I just... Yeah, no, please. Just one thing, by the way, in a previous life, I'm an accountant, so I like numbers, that's why I like numbers. But just something that came out for me that I'm just interested in what people think is you've got, you've got this, you know, Increased demand. So we've got over 80% net still showing you know, that the clients are demanding social. But combine that with nearly half saying it's a significant area for growth, but only 42% are doing it. I put those three numbers together and end up suggesting that maybe there's two streams here. A stream who are saying this is a growth area, are responding to clients and are delivering it, and a group that just aren't. There is demand coming from their clients, or there wouldn't be 81%. Right. But they're not responding. And may, maybe in this room, we've got the first stream. Well, that's great. Yeah, maybe the people who are not doing the social media measurement are all in the other room. I mean, maybe that's what's happening. <laughs> Can I? Yeah. <laughs> Please, I, I, I want to add as well another point that we see is uh, the whole area of content marketing. So content marketing is today mostly in, in the marketing departments, whereas you have to push content on the different channels, which for me is PR as you're working as well with journalists for pushing out uh, content. So there I think as well in the future we will have an, perhaps a switch from uh, 
through this content marketing area to s switch from marketing back to PR, you know, to get control of the content. But today, we don't see any integration of content marketing in the enterprise. Yeah. Any final thoughts, or we'll, we'll pick up some pace and move on? So it's, it's, I'm going to carry on, and it's going to start with, with um, my, my view of 2015 and, and a bit forward. And the first one is, I think, it's the, 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 the rise of data scientists. Uh, I first heard that term about two years ago, and I thought, uh, that's a terrible term. And then I thought, actually, it's a, it's a really clever and good term. Um, this cartoon struck me very much as um, how the early days of Metrica used to be. When I'd go to a party, uh, I was a 26-year-old, desperate to meet a nice girlfriend. Uh, I'd start chatting to someone, and she'd say, what do you do? And I'd say, I work in media analysis. And she'd go, what? And I'd go, uh, I analyze editorial content. She'd go, what? And I'd go, I work in PR. And she'd go, oh, you do advertising. And I'd go, oh, yes. And then, you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, well, I, I just blew it in other ways, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but, but it, it, this cartoon is making the similar point that you know a few years ago nobody wanted to be a, a, a math geek. Uh, now it's very cool to be a to be a data geek. Um, and the, the, we need different types of employees in our business to do this type of work. We need people who. Who, who, who can work with big data, uh, with tools, with filtering, with analyzing, with drawing out real insights. Uh, people who aren't scared of, of um, really getting down and dirty into perhaps a, a variety of tools. We heard from Ben that he, uh, at Ketchum they might have a preferred uh, tool, but that they'll work with a number of different ones. You need people who can, who can uh, do that. I think there's a business implication for all of us with this as well. I think that a lot of us have a model where we uh, charge our clients based on a fee per clip and a fee per report, something around that. We used to analyze each clip, charge, charge a price for that. I don't think the market will tolerate that for much longer. So I know a number of people are moving towards fixed price, but I think all of us are going to be in that space um, very, very soon. Um, there's too much content to have every piece of our, uh, every article uh, deeply analyzed. Therefore, you can't charge for every article in the same way that you could. So. Um, you know, I think that's something that we'll, we'll see coming. We've heard at the conference people talking about, about this. I think you know, no one disputes that. But I think there might be a, a, a slight sort of difference of opinion here. Um, I see a lot of companies moving to try and standardize stuff, make it like Tesco's or, or Walmart, I guess, you know, stack it high, sell it cheap. Uh, it's all about replicating it easily, keep it you know, very, very simple. Uh, we'll give them their dashboard, we'll give them a tool, uh, and, and, and that will do. But the problem with that is that it's not answering the questions that the clients are asking. What do the clients actually need? The question I've got to you is, do the clients need more tools, or do they need more support and advice? It's support and advice which is in high demand. Tools are a commodity. If we all rush to produce only sexy-looking tools, we're going to commoditize ourselves, and guess what then? We're going to come across the brand watches, the Radiant Sixes, the sales forces, all of them, and we're not going to win that fight. So industry suicide, I would call that. So we have to have experts. We have to offer our clients proper service uh, and answer the, uh, the so what um, factor, the advice, the support, best practice, help them plan, objective setting, work out what success looks like. Um, and uh, I don't know if Chris Foster's in this room, but I think just the fact that Chris Foster's a member of AMEC and on the board, Chris comes from Booz Allen Hamilton, a massive consulting firm, and he's always trying to give us a wake-up call. It's not just about that we need to consult, but these consulting firms are going to move into our space um, as well. Um, then I think that the industry's splitting into two camps, but I don't think the industry always quite is quite clear on it. I just think that our services are very distinctly two things. One is a backward-looking model. It's a measurement model, and there is nothing wrong with that. 90%, I should think, I just made that number up, 90% of our clients... <laughs> <laughs> I did it well there, right? I mean, you know, you can see, it's years of experience of numbers. 90% uh, of our clients... Um, are buying a service because they want to have something to take to their boss to prove the value. That's the reason they come. So if we all start talking about, we're going to give you insights, that's maybe not necessarily what they want. They might want the measurement. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, I'm not saying we don't do insights, because insights is the other 
uh, area that we need to. But I just see it as two distinct things. One is measure my value, prove my success, tell me how I've done, audit it. And the other is, OK, with this new data, now that we're looking at real-time information and conversations, let's put out the insights in here and tell me, tell me something I didn't know. Don't just give me a load of charts like it's measurement, counting stuff that doesn't matter. So give me the genuine um, insights. Um, tell me something I didn't know. And there's a question there I have, which is, is our trade association name still appropriate? The Association for the Measurement and Evaluation of Communications is an organization full of insights providers. Is it? I don't know. Question. We'll have to ask Barry about that and um, uh, put, it, put it on the table. But I see, you know, th this is Janus, by the way, the, uh, where the word January comes from, uh, who was a god uh, that sat at the beginning of the year and he looked forward to the new year and he looked back on the past year. And I think that's, that, that's fine. That's the two services that we should offer. And I think if we all keep that clear in our head, that they're two different things with two different needs, I think we'd be doing ourselves a, 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 a favour. Um, this is a slide that I've taken from one of our clients, Andrew Bowens at, at MasterCard, who talks about um, content pollution. And what he's saying there is that the PR industry is doing more and more content marketing. Um, and everyone's doing it. And his point is that PR people can't afford to put out basically what he calls crap content and that there's too much of it and that we have to, as a PR profession, um, put out good content. But because content has changed, so surely our services need to change. The old days would be to a monitoring provider, you'd say, get me every clip. To a measurement provider, you'd say, measure every clip. It's not about that now. It's about monitoring and measuring the content that matters. They don't, our clients don't want every clip that matters anymore. Uh, sorry, every clip that's out there anymore. They want the clips that, that matter. And maybe the monitoring approach of a keyword-based approach is no longer appropriate. Maybe we need to be using other techniques to look at what is the, co uh, the content that matters, and perhaps that's based around uh, the audiences, uh, the, the influencers, the topics, the conversations. Um, and so I, 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 suspect to see, I expect to see this change more. And as we look at the content that matters, uh, obviously the question of um, the measurement that matters is, becomes even more um, important. So as somebody said to me the other day, it's about measuring what matters, not just what flatters. Um, and John, John uh, Pullinger, who's the CEO of the UK uh, Statistics Authority, was quoted in the Times a week ago, uh, and this struck a, struck a call with me. He said, we have numbers everywhere, but we haven't been well schooled on how to use them. And that's where the problems occur. So we can't just, you know, I think actually it's quite a good opportunity. Many of these platforms are just producing numbers. Our opportunity is to be the intelligence that produce the, me the metrics uh, that really matter. Uh, Mayor Angelou died just recently. Fantastic quote from her. I've learned that people forget what you said, people forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And I expect to see that people trying to understand the emotional response of the content that we're putting out there will become more important. Wh how does our content drive an emotional response and what does that mean in terms of purchase consideration uh, uh, and, and other things um, like, like that? What response do I want to generate in my audience and what kind of insight can you give me on that? And I expect to see that understanding of emotions to get, to get more. Here's an obligatory photo of a cat, even though I'm al allergic to them. Um, but <laughs> but it, um, it comes with the, with, the, with the main point of what happened. We, and I've heard it again and again and again and again at this conference, and it's a wake-up call to all of us. We can't keep talking about measuring outcomes and not doing it. OK? Stop not doing it and start doing it. Because it's no good just talking about it. Let's do it. OK? So that's what our clients want. I don't know if we've got many of the clients... Uh, in the room, uh, I can see, see one over there for sure. They want to know what happened. What's happened as a result of Bill and Melinda's letter? Uh, uh, Jim McNamara, great talk yesterday in his paper. He says, outputs alone make you a cost center. Producing desired outcomes make you, makes you a value-adding function. Uh, and my final one, and this is where I'm allowing myself a few minutes extra, is I expect to see all of us promoting and using the Amex social media measurement frameworks, which we have launched today. And hopefully I'm live tweeting as I'm talking to you because I've put them all into a buffer uh, and they should be sort of popping out. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> but this is something that I'm very, very proud of that the Social Media Measurement uh, Committee has done. And, and massive thank you to Don Bartholomew, who uh, is the vice chair, who unfortunately um, can't be with us uh, due to illness today. Uh, but Don is a, is, is a fantastic chap and a great leader in our industry uh, and is a, a senior person at Ketchum in, in Dallas. Uh, who put a lot of thought into this, but also to Jonna uh, Burke and Elaine uh, and Paul Najoko and Alex Aitken from the Cabinet Office, because these guys have, have put a huge amount of work into bringing these frameworks that you may remember we actually launched last year to life. One of the problems is everyone says they're great, but I, I'm not quite sure how to use them. So to address that, we have put together a user guide. Um, Burrell's kindly created a video. Uh, we have an interactive microsite at um, socialmediameasurementframework.org um, where you can click. You've got audio, you've got video, uh, and, and a fantastic case study um, from Elaine Phillips and her colleagues at DEFRA uh, on the Chip My Dog campaign and how they've used the framework to help think about the planning, the objective setting, what success looks like, and then proving the value and being able to uh, justify some budget and to do some more campaigning with it um, uh, going into the future. So please tweet it, blog about it, but most importantly, use it. And one of the biggest things I wanted to do, I appreciate that we all compete with each other. So it's not proprietary. Every single person can apply the framework approach into their business to give their clients credible and meaningful information and to be that small voice of calm and intelligence that this industry needs. There's too much snake oil from platform sellers. This gives you an opportunity to speak like an expert um, to the client. So we've revised the social media page on Amex website as well. Um, incidentally, we have a menu of uh, suggested metrics to make it easy for you as well as you work across from outputs to outtakes to outcomes. We've got some, so you can even use it as a cheat sheet. It's all there for you to download and I'd encourage you to share it with your clients. Uh, you don't have to measure using, you know, by actually using the framework, but just use the approach to help you think about how you're going to do your, um, how you're going to do your reports. And finally, we launched last year, and in fact, it's the only social media measurement standard that has been ratified, is the transparency tables. And what we've realized that is that they needed a bit of a refresh, but also we've put them into something like eight different languages now. So they're in Chinese, or in Arabic, and French. Basically, I doubt there's someone in this room who speaks a language that they're now not in. And one of the things we have to do is all speak with a consistent language, say what we mean, mean what we say, and those transparency tables are exactly there for that. So please download them, and as an AMEC member, you're entitled to put them in your reports, and it just helps you think and explain to your client what it is, what is the information that you're using. So this is my very confident prediction that in the next year, we will all be using these frameworks uh, and these transparency tables. So that's it uh, from me for now, and I'm going to hand over to Sam. Thanks, Richard. Um, I have five minutes, but I'm not very good at keeping time, so I'm going to purposely speak a little, go a little bit fast so that I try to keep up with the time. This looks kind of complicated, but let me get get to the point that this is a chart that I showed earlier uh, this morning, my session, is that when we at CAC, we're focusing on China, social listening. We take the chatter that's on Chinese social media and now Asia Pacific. We take that chatter and we turn it into business intelligence. But we're not from, uh, we're not a PR agency. We're not a digital agency. We've always been a social analytics agency. And we've always, just to survive, we've always had to work across the organization. So we work with PR teams, we work with media teams, digital teams, marketing teams, sales teams, uh, market research teams, because they all have questions that could be answered by uh, social intelligence. And so what we've been doing the last few years is doing what we call a social business maturity study. Uh, this is all within China. We, we uh, ask about 250 marketing professionals uh, what they are doing in terms of social media, and especially in terms of how much they are spreading social media around the organization. And so companies who are dormant are doing nothing. Uh, companies who are isolated means that some companies are using one vendor for PR, they're using another vendor, social listening vendor, I should say, uh, for customer service and so on. Um, 
and ones that are testing is actually trying to integrate one vendor or one set of social listening or social intelligence best practice to integrate social across the organization. So every, all the, there's not multiple vendors, there's one vendor, there's one partner, right? And to the earlier charts that Richard had up, you know, showing that, and people saying, oh, digital agencies are getting this space, uh, uh, advertising agencies or media space agencies are getting into the social space. They, they absolutely are, because we're working with them and we're working across the organization. And for us, we actually want to, to displace all those agencies uh, by providing all the intelligence uh, across the organization. And we can see in China, at least, uh, that companies are becoming more, more so-called mature in terms of including social intelligence across the organization. So uh, we've gone from last year, 14% of companies to 26% of companies this year are scaling, meaning that they integrated social across the organization and they're, they're making it go faster and faster. So I think this is one trend that we see that's growing is that social is going to, uh, social intelligence is going to inform across the organization. Another we see is that, s we see uh, that social is going private. Um, in China, we've got a WeChat application uh, that's very, very popular, 600 million users, similar in many ways to WhatsApp, which has got over 500 million users. Similar in some ways to Line, there are uh, which is popular uh, in in like Japan um, and in other Asia Pacific countries. But all of these uh, are people are actually socializing. They're sharing content. Um, they're talking about brands. Uh, they're talking about your clients. Uh, but for the most part, we can't. We social listening uh, agency or others cannot get those conversations. They're private. So uh, we have clients now, every single question, very first question on their mouth is, what are you doing on WeChat? Well, we can't do much on WeChat because the conversations are private. We expect that this phenomena is going to get just even bigger. Uh, it's going to become uh, more challenging. Related to that is we see that there's a divergence of, uh, I would say, social uh, skill sets for social media and for social underscore business. So in China, we've got a platform called Weibo, which is sort of like a Twitter of China. Um, this is a, a, what we call tweet travel. Chanel tweeted this tweet from the Chanel account. This is the first wave of people who retweeted the, the original tweet. This is the second wave of people who retweeted the retweet, and so on and so on. This one single tweet from Chanel got exposed to, according to the tools, uh, our tools that we developed, got exposed to 127 million Weibo accounts within 24 hours. Uh, just a single push of a button of a tweet got to 127 million Weibo accounts. Part of that was using key opinion leaders. These, these are the names here. Key opinion leaders and celebrities who have millions, if not tens of millions of followers who will retweet that content. Building that ecosystem of key opinion leaders and celebrities is key to use social as a media to spread your buzz. Compare that to WeChat, I just mentioned, is, is a, it's more, it's a, like a private social network, all mobile. You know, here, Mercedes Smart, they set up a, a, a campaign where they sold 388 cars in three minutes on WeChat. WeChat is not really a media, it's its own ecosystem. For, you know, I can spend hours trying to explain what it is. It's just, it's not very, it's not a viral media. It's social, but it's not very viral. So there's a different kind of specialist needs to work with clients to figure out how to leverage this very unique media to have this kind of impact for social business. So it's, we see that social is not just about media anymore. Um, we see more and more clients going to fancy social media command centers. Uh, this is one we built for Nestle in, uh, in Beijing. Right, so it's big, big data, big screens, big visualizations. It's very, very beautiful. But they don't call it, interestingly, they don't call it a social media command center or social media war room. Uh, they're calling it a data activation team, focusing on data. Um, we see Nestle and we see other clients we work with. Yes, they want social data, but they also want search data. They want e-commerce data. They want media data. They want any digital data that can be used to measure, but also digital data that actually has insight 
built into it, real-time or near-real-time source of insight. So with social, you can see what people are talking about. Search, you can see what they're looking for, what they're searching for. E-commerce, you can see what they are buying. If you can combine, a, look at these individually, but of course, eventually integrate. You know, this is what we see the future of, uh, I don't like the term, but big data insights. I'm going to come up with another word for big data that's not so boring, but big data insights. We think that this is, uh, at least in our industry, in the social listening industry, this is the future. The day of, of individual or independent social listening firms that are only doing social, I think those days, those days are numbered. We've got to in integrate other sets of, di of digital, real-time, uh, insight-rich data. Finally, and this is a chart I showed this morning, um, with, with those command centers that I just showed you, they're great for showing information. Inform visualized information, very, very beautiful, very, very cool. Eye candy, you know, out the door. It's crazy. It's awesome. But this kind of information, it creates more questions than answers. Why did my buzz go up, right? Um, we also have insight. And this is something that CIC does a lot of. We produce very detailed, very immaculate, uh, insightful monthly and quarterly uh, reports tracking everything and explaining you know not only what's happening wh why it's happening but now what does it mean what we're finding is that that's too slow clients is too much information it's too detailed they don't have the time uh, to read such a detailed report they have beautiful visualizations uh, like we saw in this, the screens uh, in the command center but what does it mean and actually, how do I even read it? So we see the future as more about agile insights. Okay? We are now putting people on site, on the client site, okay, who can use our tools, who can interp interpret our reports in a very, uh, very quick and easy way for our clients. Our clients have a question right now. They need an answer right now. It can be 60% comprehensive. In terms of comprehensiveness of the data, it can be 60% or 70%, not 100%. Uh, it can be uh, maybe 70 percent of the quality or in terms of in-depth analysis that you get on a once, once a month basis, but it answers the question right now with enough data uh, to have an informed decision or an informed uh, insight. So we think having these agile insights uh, that's more than just providing information, but it's faster than providing more in-depth report, I think this is another key future, at least within uh, our, our industry. Thank you. And next is Christopher. So I want to share as well uh, uh, our vision on how we see uh, the market evolving over the next uh, year. So a uh, first one is really the growing need for converged media optimization. So what is converged media? So we're talking about paid, owned, and earned, combining this together in order to get more insights. So really, on one side, everything that's the advertising, earned, everything that is uh, being written, and owned, everything that is controlled by the brand. And there we have intersections that have, where we have to analyze and get more insights out of this in order to, to optimize in the end and not just only measure. The second step is really benchmarking. So uh, g going from man tracking everything that is c happening about uh, the own brand to what is going on in the industry. How, uh, how is a brand positioned uh, in the industry? And there, for example, I'm talking about owned media. So to see, OK, now, for example, on my Facebook page, my fra my f I have a fan growth of 5% per week. Is this good, good or is this bad in the transportation uh, industry? And really to evaluate this and then afterwards to track, OK, owned versus earned versus paid and get everything converged media insights out of that. And then, of course, the aim of that is to calculate an ROI in the end. A second uh, uh, point is everything that is content marketing and social advertising. So uh, we think that uh, in terms of content marketing, uh, the content has to be high quality because without having a high quality con content, people will not engage anymore. Uh, but on the other side, even if you have high quality content being published on your Facebook page, the reach of your Facebook page, the organic reach decreased due to, of course, Facebook that wants to sell more advertising. So it is logic that social advertising will grow over time. 
for there we were uh, we, we have just a graph for example for the US social media advertising uh, which have a forecast of 11 billion uh, spendings in 2017 where on the left the left hand side you see really like the organic reach is really drastically uh, decreasing as the companies as Facebook and Twitter have to generate revenue as well another trend we see is the first steps into image and uh, video tracking uh, I think that's a, a really high-tech uh, field where today uh, we don't see really high quality uh, provide us a lot of manual work you know to attack what is happening uh, what is being what 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 is uh, what is what is pictured let's say like this and as well what's happening in uh, videos you see here that's a uh, chart from Kleiner Perkins uh, so in, in a big VC company in the US so uh, what they were doing is really to see okay what are the daily number of photos uploaded and shared on the selected platforms so there you see Flickr in uh, I don't know where to push yeah so Flickr it is not even appearing anymore in this uh, graph. Whereas you have closed communities as uh, Snapchat, uh, as uh, Instagram, as uh, WhatsApp that are really increasing uh, over time. And I think that's uh, as well an insight that Sam already uh, shared before. And as well on the other side here, that's an, uh, that's, an evalu that's, an, uh, that's a graph where they were evaluating, okay, what are the, where do American teens, which platforms do they use? And there we see really a big change as well uh, from switching really from uh, uh, from Twitter and, uh, and and Facebook to uh, Instagram and more content oriented networks. A, thir a fourth one, I think that's a pretty obvious one, is uh, mobile. So mobile, of course, will change the uh, media consumption. There will be different uh, in terms of measurement. Localize localization will get more important. Tracking everything that is related to e-commerce gets uh, uh, more, more more important, and of course, everything that is related to the spendings. So here is as well a graph from Kleiner Perkins where they uh, say that in mobile, which will be in a 30 billion uh, uh, market in uh, 2014, whereas we see on the other side, of course, print and radio decreasing, internet still increasing, and social uh, and sorry and mobile really uh, increasing very fast. The fifth trend uh, we see is the gravities between content and connection networks. So having on the left side sort of the more traditional social networks like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google+, Plus. on the right hand side YouTube, Instagram, Pinterest, Tumblr, uh, Vine and so forth. So on the left hand side it, it was all about building communities in managing your friends and managing your professional networks. Whereas on the, on the right hand side is really like having one channel and pushing content in these channels. And there we see as well, it is emerging. So Facebook is getting more and more about content, about advertising, whereas YouTube wants to build, of course, a community that people share different videos within uh, this community. And the sixth one is really the growing need for real time measurement and insights as social goes uh, enterprise. So that's, that's a chart of Gartner that have uh, divided the social uh, adoption of an uh, of, 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 uh, of enterprises into uh, five steps so really on the left hand side starting with let's say monitoring growing going to the right hand side where social goods enterprise being integrated into the different uh, departments and of course a logical step out of that is that the needs for analytics grows because you have much more data you have much more channels you have owned you have earned you have paid you have converged you have e-commerce you have search so you have all types of data that is converging together and where you get where you have to generate insights out of that and for of course for uh, for getting this insight out of the data you need data scientists and uh, this is where we see as well the industry uh, going thank you All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to kind of give an agency perspective on social media measurement and kind of where we see it going. So I have some very bold and very small font predictions for the coming year. But before we get into that, I just want to give a bit of perspective about from an agency like Ketchum where we are with that uh, comes to social media measurement and working with our clients. And had I known that we were going to have a lot of video clips at this conference, I would have actually included the classic clip of uh, Rod Tidwell and the greatest agent in the world, Jerry Maguire, giving the help you, help me, or help me help you uh, in the shower scene. But we're really there to act as stewards for our clients, to really be there to guide them and help them through social media measurement. And as I kind of 
hinted at before, that could be helping procure the right tool for them and being as agnostic as possible and finding the solution that fits their needs or working directly uh, with uh, the tools that they already purchase and or being administrators for their channels and really uh, being the ones to help guide them through that process. So they're really looking, f looking to us on the agency side to help them make sense of the activity that they're doing across social channels and produce reporting that uh, makes sense for their business and for the people they answer to within that business. So what that has kind of said, uh, what that's kind of um, forced us to do is be, be a little geek chic. And I think Richard has already kind of touched on this before, but there's a need for more people within agency side who have the skills, not just in research and measurement like myself, but on the digital listening, planning side, to people on the content side, to people who are designers. There's a whole plethora, a whole, a much larger integrated service team now in organizations like Ketchum who are able to surround the client with the right skills to help deliver, uh, deliver the content, to track the content, draw insights from the content, and to report back uh, to the business. So if I'm looking towards the future and kind of what I think is going to happen, not just in 2015, but years beyond, I think it's going to be a continued evolution and moving away from you know, old ways of kind of thinking about the sentiment or people's relationship with content, which traditionally negative, positive, neutral, but something that's more emotive to really trying to understand uh, people that are interacting with that. What does that do to them on a very human, human element uh, level? Uh, are they detracting that content? Did it inspire them to do something? And I, I know that uh, the crimson hexagons of the world are starting to develop you know, natural language analyses and algorithms to help make it easier to track and identify those conversations. So that's going to continue to evolve. But again, to what I was saying about the geek chic agencies, you need people that are able to kind of create the right types of searches and define content to really dig into that, dig into it to find out what are, what are the emotional elements uh, that are being conveyed. And I think also it speaks to Sam's point earlier too about the need for agile insights. So we, we need the right tools and the right people to do that. And then lastly, we just, we just touched on this. I'm kind of having the same point. This is that we think that uh, rec you know, image recognition is really going to be a hot trend in 2015 in terms of how we are searching for, finding, tracking, and reporting back on the content we're creating. So if we as agencies are pushing out more and more content, are being asked more and more to develop strategy, and then deliver content for our clients, uh, then we're going to need the tools to be able to find, find that information, but find the content we're pushing out, but also the content that's being created that may not be hashtagged or SEO'd out there um, that's being created by our target audiences and to understand how in the natural environment, in the natural world, how they're engaging uh, with our clients' brands. So that's, that's it for me, briefly, agency side, and I now hand it over to, uh, to Adam. Thanks, Ben. Right, I get to go last. And, uh, and I'm going to take a bit of a different approach, not quite so serious. Uh, although I have got the obligatory pop culture reference at the beginning, which if I'd known that you, you, you had, I might not have included. The, um, does everyone know this film, The Matrix? OK, so I hope we're not all plugged into it in reality, and this really is the real world that we're currently living in. I just put that up to remind us that when we're doing outcomes, that all this data we're analyzing, all this wonderful big data that's just so exciting, and there's so much of it to look at, but any outcome you're measuring has almost certainly got a real world scenario in mind. I want to sell more product, I want to get more donations, I want more people to volunteer. It is not I want more tweets or more followers. So outcomes will have a real world perspective. And so the use of that social data or any data that we're using we need to bear in mind still has to translate into real world relevance. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of Nate Silver. Okay, Nate's my, I'm a huge fan. I am, you know, I'd start the fan club. And Nate came out with this, which is very relevant to what we just described. We're not that much smarter than we used to be. Even though we have much more information, and that means the real skill is learning how to pick out the useful information from the noise. The amount of noise that's being created is growing at an exponential rate. The amount of useful things within it is not. So actually, that task just gets harder and harder and harder. And I thought Jim's talk yesterday was awesome. And I love that because he speaks to me of the fact that we can get a little bit too excited about huge amounts of data as if that has to have the answer. And sometimes some qualitative thought actually can be very valuable. 
So I just wanted to leave you with an exercise just to maybe indicate that. If I was trying to decide who was more influential than somebody else, I see this in platforms that exist right now. We've got A and B. These are two accounts on Twitter. These are real people, by the way. If I told you that A's tweeted 8,671 times and B's only tweeted 598 times, does that tell me one's more influential? No, surely not. I told you one's got 3,000 followers, though, and one's got 500. Does that mean they're more influential? They're in the same field, I hasten to add, and they're relevant to each other. I can name, but I wouldn't, platforms that literally that's about as far as they'd go to decide whether they were more influential or not. What if I told you this is listed as in Twitter lists? So one appears in nine times more Twitter lists. Right, surely this person's just way off the chart compared to the other one by now, aren't they? What if I can tell you that in the last month when I did this, A's been retweeted 187 times and B hasn't been retweeted at all? Right, now clearly B has no influence whatsoever. Surely, we've all concluded that. A's been mentioned 61 times, B has been mentioned once. Now, maybe that's be all because the last tweet by A, and I did this on the 30th, is that day, and the last tweet by B, though, was nine months beforehand. So B just isn't participating in the conversation on Twitter. Yes, but B still exists in the real world. And finally, the wonderful clout score. So A's got a clout score of 57, and B's got a clout score of 32. So let's put all that together. That's actually more ways of met more metrics than I see lots of people apply to decide if someone's more influential than somebody else. So hands up who thinks A is stand up amazingly just way off the chart more influential than B. <laughs> hands up who thinks B is way off the chart more influential than A. Hands up who says I don't know because I don't know who they are. <laughs> yes. If I then told you that they're both in the measurement space and they're both followed by all of these people, <laughs> many of whom you will probably recognize, I would hope, now you maybe get a slightly better idea of the fact that maybe they both have some potential for influence. And now if I tell you that A is our illustrious <laughs> chairman and B is our just as illustrious <laughs> organizer, now you know who they are, you will have made more of an assessment of how influential you think they are just on knowing that, because you know who they are, than any of those stats I just gave you before. So relevance, as was so rightly pointed out by Matt yesterday, and qualitative, as Jim brought out yesterday, really do matter when it comes to looking at metrics. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Adam. You can see why I so enthusiastically put my hand up for, for A, um, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got five more minutes, I think, for um, questions. Did any of that provoke, um, provoke some thoughts? Um, anyone feeling inspired? Anyone feeling we've missed something? A question at the front. We've got a microphone here, if you could introduce yourself, and please. Hi, my name is John Frisland. I'm from Retriever, Sweden. Uh, I wanted to put a question to uh, Mr. Chinaman here, um, <laughs> <laughs> who, was, uh, who was talking about the uh, different uh, uh, social medias that wasn't uh, open, um, and you also, um, you also had a, uh, a, a slide that uh, implied that the uh, more agile insight or more agile reports were uh, were wished for by the clients. Is this something that only exists on the very large markets like the Chinese and, and Asian markets rather than for uh, smaller companies uh, on, on smaller or, or even large companies on smaller markets that doesn't have that kind of uh, uh, the volumes? I think what I, what I was trying to communicate was that there is, uh, with big data, um, there's an explosion of data. 
Um, and there are a lot of plat lot of uh, platforms now out there, out there, like social listening platforms, uh, that will display that data um, in a very visibly or visually interesting way. And there are uh, other consulting companies. I mean, to your point, where there are more and more consulting companies providing more, uh, you know, pr providing a perspective and insight. And I, I think that. And there's this need somewhere in the middle where you don't need the fancy in-depth reports. Uh, you just have a specific question, a specific need uh, to get addressed like right now. And with big data conceivably at your fingertips, there's an opportunity to be able to answer that, especially if you're a, you know, it also plays into the data scientist uh, idea that was presented after me. I think the need for business uh, for uh, business questions to be answered would be universal. I mean, whether big companies or, or small companies. Um, and I, I don't think it's a big company, small company thing. Uh, now, maybe the bigger companies that are, uh, or the bigger markets that can afford the bigger solutions. Uh, but then you don't always have to have the fanciest of dashboards or the fanciest of tools to still get at those uh, those those answers. I mean, you can still do Google searches. Uh, you can still search on Twitter and so on. Uh, you know, for those companies that don't have that kind of budget. Um, of course, the more data you have, the more sophisticated answers you need. The more, the better to have better tools. But I don't think it's 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 a question that's going to be ch challenging all companies. I believe. I think we've had some consistent messages from the from from the team. Uh, on, on some of the challenges. I think hopefully there's been a bit of a wake-up call to all of us. We're, we're saying one thing, but we're doing another thing. And if we're going to succeed uh, in, in the face of some of the challenges that we have, um, we need to change our behaviour. So when we come together in a city yet to be defined, I believe, in, in a year's time, I'd hope to see, um, I'd hope to see some, some changes. So a big thank you to Sam, to Christoph, to Adam, uh, and Ben, and one final point before we end um, is a plea from me to you, which is that um, the social media measurement group, which I chair, uh, has done some fantastic work so far, but we've, we're, we're changing around the membership at the moment, and we've got um, places for some fresh people to join. And um, I really am looking for people who'd like to help us get the message across on best practice. We don't want to go inventing new scoring systems and things like that. We just want to drive a consistent message globally about how to measure in a credible and meaningful way. Um, and I would really welcome people who can genuinely commit time uh, and effort to support us um, right across the world and into different sectors, PR agencies, in-house, uh, and other disciplines as well. So please um, get in touch with me, you'll find me on Twitter, um, as Adam showed us, uh, at Richard Bagnall. That's an easy way of getting hold of me or uh, through my work email address, bagnall at prime-research.com. So enjoy the rest of the conference. Good luck to everybody for the awards tonight. And thank you so much for being in our session.